Hi, Leroy. Hey, what's going on? I don't know. I was going to ask you. <laughs> oh, I know about as much as I knew last week, which is haven't enough. heard from Jim. I have not. Hmm. No, and it uh, when I went in to uh, look at our uh, meeting announcement. The last update was the one that I did last week. So I I haven't seen anything. I sent him an email a couple of minutes ago, but uh, I haven't heard anything back. And uh, I guess that uh, have you heard from Gail? I have not. I, I haven't really heard from anybody. Hmm. I am I am in the dark, just like just like us <laughs> just like everyone else um so I, I don't know i barry found us last week but we uh we may be the only two again hmm. okay because i haven't hmm. i haven't gotten an email or anything hmm um and I don't know how to fix that problem either because I don't have access to the uh, to the email list. So. Okay. Well, the only email I've got is Jim's, and then of course I've got the the old links or legacy links, whatever you want to call them, to the Zoom session. But that's it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't know how to fix the problem either. I mean, <laughs> well, do you have contact with Gail? Just via email, and she's uh, she, she she's not real clear about some stuff that she when she emails back, and I'm not real sure that she actually has access to the entire list either. Well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, belatedly, the list get did get emailed. So I have to assume that either she did it or she did it with Jim's instructions or whatever. Um, yeah. It, see, last week, it almost sounds like he's he tried to send it from the hospital or something from last week but well, I, I thought not... that he was supposed to be out of the hospital a little over a week ago wow a week ago tuesday i thought so too well i'll tell you what i'm going to give you my email in the chat session okay and that way you've got at least email to one of us <laughs> So let me put it in the chat session. Make sure you uh, send it to everyone or just to me or something. Uh, I'll give you mine too. Uh, let's see. Let's see, I, I have, I have, Okay, I have a few. Did you get Did you get mine? Yep. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. What did I, you? Say? I have I have a few people's email addresses, but nowhere near as many. Well, I mean, I don't the have a list or anything. I just have. Well, like, the whole list is several hundred. I have the impression. Yeah. Because if you look at the membership, the membership is yeah, several it's, hundred. It's, it's big, but I've got I've got Vicente's email address. I've got Ray's email address. I think that's really about it. <laughs> okay. I don't really have a whole lot of people's email address. Okay, that's. Uh, let me just. Do a screen grab of the. Um... Well, I just I just sent you an email, so. 
Oh, you'll get my. You should get it. Okay. And amazingly hmm. enough, when I did that, maybe when I sent you the email, I may have already had yours because when I pasted your email address in, it told me that you were art. Oh, okay. So I may well, have I, ju had I just got yours. Um, now, there's a surprise. You still have an a AOL account? I do. <laughs> and I still, and I and I still use it from time to time. I um, I think mine uh, somehow or another I blocked it about fifteen years ago. I mean, I had gotten to the point where I wasn't using it, and. They were still doing this business back. This is back when they were still sending out a, D, a CD about yeah. once every week or so. <laughs> that was that was when I got my very first AOL free my free AOL email address was shortly before they stopped sending out those CDs. Well, now I assume that uh, that the um, Currently, AOLs are, are paid or not, or they're free. Um, I I still have my email address is still free. Okay. So I get a lot of ads though, so you know a lot of just garbage from from that. So I don't really use it a whole lot. Usually I. If I don't really want somebody to email me, I will give them that email address and because <laughs> I may or may not ever actually see it. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got, I've still got uh, uh, an old Hotmail address that I've never used. I'm not I, even... I actually never had a Hotmail account. I had an Earthlink account and oh, I remember Earthlink. Yeah. a couple of Earthlink accounts and so forth and so on. But I, I never ever had a Hotmail account. I still have a Net Zero account, and I really have, I have told them to delete it like a dozen times because I never use it, and I get emails every now and then that say. You need to check in, and or we're going to delete. And I'm like, just delete it. Just, Be my guess. <laughs> just, just delete it. But it's never gone away. I've, I've, I'm like, okay, whatever. I've had that. I've had that since probably 2000. I probably have. I've had that for 20 years. Yeah. Um. I have a, a Yahoo email address. I never had a Yahoo. Yeah, I'm. I got an email from them the other day that said if I don't check in, that they would uh, delete it, and I'm like, oh, I still have that. Okay, I'll go check. So I, I checked. <laughs> I kept assuming that through all their travails that. They were going to go out of business anyway. Uh, the fact that they're still surviving at all, I find kind of amazing. But I think they were bought by somebody else, weren't they? Um, AOL and Yahoo are owned by the same company now. But neither of neither of them are owned by either Yahoo or AOL. I yeah, believe. it's it, it's somebody else. Um, yeah. And they have changed it. Yeah. They have changed hands. Verizon owns them. Verizon owns them. They have changed hands, um, you know, dozens of times. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, AOL was a groundbreaker uh, back 25 years ago. So Yahoo really was too back. Back. Yeah, and then the they, and then they days. hired that female CEO who was a piece of work. Yeah. 
and she basically managed to destroy the company, at least from my perspective. I suppose that would be interpreted as some kind of sexist, but uh, <laughs> as far as I was concerned, she was a disaster. All of my Yahoo went off my went out of my portfolio. I just said, <laughs> "This is this is not going to survive." Yahoo. They they uh, had a an auction site, and they were competing with or trying to compete with eBay. Really. And I'll tell you that their their auctions were fantastic. It. I mean, they, it should have lasted. It should have. It should have taken eBay out. But uh, I, I was making a ton of money off of Yahoo's auction site. Really? Yeah. I, I mean, I would just put stuff on that I couldn't sell on eBay, and it would sell. And I'm like, woohoo! Were they pretty much exclusively U.S. or were they international, like eBay? Um, I think the auction was Australia, U.S., and maybe the U.K. Oh, okay. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't entirely worldwide, but it wasn't limited to the U.S. Okay. Um, but you could tell. I mean, you could you could set your preferences. So if you didn't want to ship something overseas, you could say, you know, we're only. I think eBay country. is largely Asian these days, isn't it? It's mostly, uh, well, it depends on what you buy, but yeah, I mean, electronics, the electronics and whatever parts. we come from, from China mostly. I remember while well, you talk about buying other things, uh, back about, I guess, 15, 20 years ago, my older daughter was my oldest daughter was um, heavily into growing orchids and breeding orchids. And I remember buying her as gifts, a few orchids online. And those would come from not just Asia, they would come from, uh, I don't remember any of them ever coming from Europe, but I think the, a number of them came from places like Hawaii and, yeah. California and various other growers. Um, so, thing that uh, I mean, I buy I buy quite a bit on eBay, and eBay is pretty good about making sure that you get what you paid for and whatever. Um, uh huh. But but something that kind of bugs me, they don't. I've, I've bought from several sellers that say that they have U.S. warehouses or whatever, so you're expecting the stuff to get here a little faster, and it comes from China, and they, yeah. there's they don't really enforce, so you know that you know they don't really enforce that it has to be from where they actually are instead of where they say they are, and that bugs me, but. Well, there are as long as of, I get my stuff, I guess I'm all right. Yeah. Well, a lot of them, I think, are do at least have uh, U.S. stocking sites. Uh, so, yeah, that cer certainly helps. Well, I I bought something from a guy though, and I, I it was it was a book, and I could have bought the book from Am uh, from Amazon. Um, it would have been a little tiny bit more expensive from Amazon. And he said that he was in Toledo, Ohio. So I was expecting it to show up in two or three days. Yeah, all right. <laughs> he apparently sent all his stock to an Amazon warehouse that was in California. Yeah. And so when I bought it, he placed the order for his stock to be resent. And it came via Amazon from California, and it took oh, three weeks to get here. And I'm like, I kind of wanted the book. I don't really care now. I mean, you well, know. 
Well, that's interesting because when I order stuff from Amazon and depending on where I am, whether I have here in Milford or in Fremont, California, um, a lot of times it'll come from someplace across the country. For example, I'll be in California and something will ship out of Virginia and it'll, it'll hit the warehouse there in uh, Northern Kentucky, one of the warehouses mm -hmm. in Northern Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it acts like it does a straight shot from there. Um, but I still get turned around in uh, three, four days, something yeah. like that yeah. out of Amazon. This, I, I mean, honestly, this was the first time that it took three weeks, but I, I have a feeling it was because uh, they sent it postal and they sent it media mail and they did run oh. it through the Amazon system. Oh. oh, okay. Because the stuff I'm talking about normally comes through the Amazon system. And I got to tell you, around here, down here in Milford, we have... Yeah. A fleet of these Amazon trucks with a big logo on the side. They make multiple times daily drop off in the neighborhood. You see them going zooming up the street. <laughs> Isn't there a warehouse there in Milford or somewhere? No, I think um, uh, I think these are coming out of I think these are coming out of uh, northern out Kentucky. of Kentucky, I believe. Although I have to say this, a lot of the stuff where the last mile is USPS will go to Fairfield. Yeah. And it'll go from Kentucky to Fairfield and then Wherever. be marked out for out for delivery out of Fairfield. And I'm assuming that they've got some kind of a stocking warehouse or at least a transshipment point in uh fairfield we were uh me and, me and patty were down in fairfield a couple weeks ago and it was pretty early we normally wouldn't have been down there that early but it was probably eight o'clock in the morning maybe maybe even a little earlier and right there on route four um probably 50 or 60 Amazon trucks came off of a side street. And I yeah. was like, yep, they're, they've loaded up. They're going out for their deliveries for the day. Oh yeah. <laughs> so there, there's probably a warehouse down there in Fairfield somewhere. Well, I we know see... there's one in Monroe. I'm not sure where Monroe is. Um, We're roughly, Monroe is roughly 25 miles north of Cincinnati. So um, is it east or, or I mean, it's over by Westchester or further east than that or? It's, it's north of Westchester. Okay. By 10 miles north of Westchester. Up 75 or up, up 71? 75. Okay. Yeah. So it used to go in towards Dayton, Dayton then. Right, right. But I thought uh, Fairfield was over uh, in Warren County. Is that Fairfield, right? Or? Fairfield is uh, close to Hamilton. Huh. Down, down uh, south, south of me. Huh. So where would it be from where we meet in Westchester there? Fairfield would be, let's see, Westchester, 127 will take you over to Hamilton. So that, That's west? that would be going west. So if you went a little north and, and hit 127 and, and went over. So okay. it, it would be west of of the library. Okay. All right. I got um, it. Yeah, more or less, more or less west. 
Uh, okay. Hamilton is southwest of where I am, so. Oh, so okay. All right, so I got it. So they're more. They're more south than west, but they're they're southwest. So it's west of seventy five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Monroe, Monroe, though they they've got a huge. I mean, it it's probably a hundred and uh, hundred and twenty acre building of Amazon warehouse. Oh, okay. It's huge. It it. Well, the com the big, it's one of the biggest warehouses I've seen. Well, the complex down there in northern Kentucky, close to the, not far from the airport, yeah. uh, is, yeah, that... a, is a multi-building uh, multi, um, facility. And of course, that's where they're putting in a new one because they did a groundbreaking on that, what, uh, a year ago. And uh, the, that's after they made the decision that the uh, CBG Airport would be one of their yeah. major uh, dis distribution sites. That 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 one uh, down there has to be pretty big too, because a lot of stuff goes through there. Almost everything that I order goes through that one in Kentucky. Uh huh. Almost everything. A few things hit Columbus before they get to me, but. Yeah, I, um, a few years ago, I ordered a book from uh, Half Price Books. I don't remember what it was. It was, I, I'm drawing a blank on what it was at this point. So um, I ordered it from my Half Price Bookstore in Fremont. And I don't usually order books, but they handle used books, and I found this one there. So, so uh, at any rate, I put this thing on order through the local bookstore, and when it arrived, Half Price Books has a pretty good network. They they keep track of their um, of some of their inventory. Turns out they don't keep track of their fiction. Yeah. But they keep track of all the nonfiction. Um, so when it arrived, it arrived from a half price books that is within walking distance of my parents' house <laughs> in Columbus. I mean, it is, I have literally, I, I think I've literally walked to that place from my parents' house. Yeah. So, so you never can tell where these where once you once you track your inventory worldwide then it becomes relatively easy to um uh distribute stuff from wherever yeah half, half price books um i've never really had a problem with half price books I website, they don't track the games either so you either have to call the store to find out if they've got a certain game or if they, you, you know, I think that's a drawback of their website because I think they would sell a lot of uh, used games if they open that up to. Well, my interpretation of them not tracking fiction inventory is that there is just so much of it that um and a lot of that you do local turnover on. Yeah. i mean people yeah. come on site i mean at least pre-covid 19 uh, come on site and browse through it and walk out with half a dozen books and uh, so probably the turnover is a lot faster with that and yeah. also uh the um the I, I, I pricing agree. on it is limited. I, I talked to one of the uh, one of the guy. I was looking for a, a certain game once, um, and 
he apparently they, they they've got access to inventory of other stores in the area because he got on his computer and he started looking he said no no one's has has that but we can we can take your name and number if we ever get it or whatever i'm like it's all right i'll i can find it on amazon or yeah somewhere but uh so apparently the the inventory is there it's just the website track doesn't it. track it yeah but um my, i've i've bought a lot of stuff particularly a lot of fiction over the years at uh half price books and they have pretty good, decent prices on them so most of the time um i usually i usually don't buy a whole lot of books from them i buy uh videos and games and um you know, every now and then uh, they'll have a book sitting there that I'll go, oh, yeah, I need that book. <laughs> yeah. But they they also, they, they don't really have a whole lot of books I'm interested in. I mean, you know, I like, I like reading Raspberry Pi books and that kind of stuff, and they don't usually have a lot of that stuff. Well, what I've noticed, at least in the Fremont store, um, is that their technical books are frequently very dated. Yeah. So I suspect that in many cases they are cleaning, they, they get it as a result of somebody kicking the butt get, and the rest of the family sells off, you know, a few hundred books to, um, you know, Uncle Joe's or Grandpa right. so and so's right. Right. books to uh, half price books. You don't know anything else to do with it. Um, but uh, certainly, it's been my experience that, uh, at least in the Fremont store, that the um, they by the time the technical books appear on the shelves, they're pretty dated. Um, now, sometimes that's what you want, but usually the problem with technology is the book is obsolete by the time the ink is dry. Right? I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I told there, there was one book I was looking for and it was a technology book. I never did find it, but I, I finally just told Patty, I said, you know, all this information's online. All I have to do is Google yeah. it. And then I have to just kind of compile it together to, to yeah. have the same information. But. A lot of times uh, you're right. And of course, the, the, the thing that the book does for you is it consolidates the references and so forth all in one spot. Yeah. Whereas otherwise you, you've got a you know, uh, you're sitting there be between two or three browsers going, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that's it, okay, yep. <laughs> or, or like in, in some cases, uh, especially with some of the projects uh, that I've done, something slightly has changed between this version of the ID and this version of the ID, yeah, and now yeah. it's not a, a per parenthesis that it wants, now it's a colon or something that it yeah. wants. And that well, will drive you nuts. <laughs> well, it's like it's, it's a lot of times that the error messages are not very specific about. They just barf. They don't say, you know, yeah, yeah. here's the reason I barf. They just. Yeah. <laughs> I found out that a fair amount between Python 2 and Python 3. The, there were a bunch of, for some reason or another, there were a bunch of syntax changes between the two versions of Python. I, and they seemed kind of pointless to me, but they they caused things to just plain don't, not work. Don't, don't, okay. I went through one program, <clears throat> one Python program that I, I had written uh, probably two or three years ago, it was one of my first, one one that I still didn't really know what I was doing. And I tried it uh, because it needed to be updated 
the uh, the API calls had changed and, and something else. And I tried it with Python 3 and Python 3 went, you're using spaces and not tabs. And I'm like, seriously, you're going <laughs> yeah. to make me go in there and change all them damn spaces to tabs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, or the other way around. And maybe it was the other way. Or I, I, I don't remember, but I was going, oh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> Why it'd be nice if <laughs> it'd be nice if somebody put together a tool that just automated the transition process from to the obviously when when they put together Python three they didn't think about backward compatibility at all. No, yeah, Python three seems like it's a it's a it's its own thing. It it yeah, they should just. Okay, it's based on Python 2, sort of, but not really. Just just yeah. move along. <laughs> yeah. Although I will say some of the some of the scripts I use really saved me a ton of money. A ton of not money, ton of time. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah. Well, it, it, it like like in my case, it may have been that Python two wasn't as picky about some of that stuff either. Yeah, like, could be. You know, but I I I dealt with that, and I'm like, okay, delete, 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 tab, delete, 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 tab. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Spend an hour, hour. Delete, 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 tab, delete, 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 tab. Well, there's then, probably in one of my editors, um, on on Linux, one of the uh, I, I the the text editor. When you hit tab, it actually puts spaces, and I think that that was part of the problem too. Was because I was editing this file in uh, in the text editor, and I wasn't really putting tabs. I was putting five. You were spaces. putting spaces in. Okay. <laughs> So is that nano or VI or what? Uh, I don't remember. Um, which one is this? I I'm 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 a VI editor person from my Unix days back in the early '80s. So uh, that that is, you know, just. Excellent. I feel very comfortable with VI. Nano, I've got to remember, oh, yeah, to do that, I got to do this and so forth and so on. See, I, I never really liked VI. I liked Nano really? for, for the, from the command line. Um, well, one of, the, one of the things I like about VI is you never have to touch the mouse. Basically, you can do everything with a with a a two keystroke uh, combo or a one keystroke combo and so you never have to take your hands off the keyboard almost all other editors these days you got to hop from the keyboard to the mouse to the keyboard to the mouse and so forth and so on uh -oh. um yeah i i guess i yeah yeah, I can see that. Even though I, I know most of the shortcuts in, in uh, Nano, the control keys. Mm -hmm. I guess well, I still. I think it becomes a matter of what you cut your teeth on and what you, uh, what you, what you learn first. Uh, in the early 80s, I was doing a lot of Pascal. Yeah. I haven't done a Pascal. <laughs> program i don't know if i could even still read the code but i haven't done a pascal program in probably 25 years or more but in the early in the early um, in the early 80s i was doing a lot of pascal and they used some um some keystroke combinations that they picked up from WordStar. Yep. They used the default stuff from WordStar. Now, I had worked 
with WordStar going way back into the 70s. I don't know when that first came available, but uh, well back into the 70s. So, so when Pascal came along, and then my first Pascal compiler was um, one from Borland. I don't know if you remember Borland or not, yeah. but yep. they came out with inexpensive compilers. I think they cost 25, 30 bucks, something like that. Came on one floppy and uh, they came out with Pascal first and then they came out with C and then with C++ and so forth and so on. By the time they got out, got C++ out, I was almost exclusively on Unix. This was obviously before Linux. Uh, I was almost exclusively on Unix and um, uh, of course the, the default editor there that I used was, uh, was VI. I don't know if they if they had other default editors in those days, but the one I used, I was doing uh, Unix stuff both on System 5 on, uh, what is it, BSD, B BCSD or Berkeley, whatever it is. Yeah, BSD. Uh, yeah, BSD. And uh, so I got really used to using the VI editor and I found it very comfortable. And the main thing I, I found comfortable going forward into the 2000 was the fact that I didn't use the mouse because it always annoyed me to hop from <laughs> the keyboard to the mouse to the keyboard to the mouse and so forth and so on. I guess uh, 2000, 2005 I'm, I'm not sure when the whenever the first version of Ubuntu came out it I had tried Linux once before or a couple of times before and it was so messy to install and, and, and nothing ever actually worked right and one of my friends said try uh, Ubuntu so I tried Ubuntu I tried the very first version of Ubuntu it installed with no problem. It picked up everything except my wireless driver, which was pretty common back then. But everything worked the way it was supposed to. It picked up the video drivers. It picked up everything. And of yeah. course, its default command line editor was Nano. So Nano was really the first command line editor that I ever used. So that's what I got used to using. And that's, I mean, that's the easy one. But uh, VI was there, Vim was there. Yeah, VI, VI was there from day one, I yeah. know that. It was there, but when it, when it popped up and said, what do you want to make your default? It was already highlighted to be Nano. And I just said, okay. Okay. Hit yeah. enter. I'll I tell you really one. Have, I didn't really have a clue what one I should choose. <laughs> One of the things that didn't work out of the box with the early Ubuntu was printers. Printer drivers were, were a mess. And I think it was about 2009 or 2010 before they started to get their act together on, uh, on uh, printers. And I think, printer drivers, and I think the problem there was, uh, of course it was built on top of Debian Mm -hmm. Debian, however you want to pronounce, to pronounce it. And I think the problem there was Debian. I, I don't think the problem was fundamentally Ubuntu. I, uh, at the time that I had tried that, the only printers I had were HPs. Uh -huh. And HPs just worked. They, they didn't need anything special. Um, although I will say that I had to select like like I think I had a 550, and the only driver that that they had were the 500 series was 500, so I lost a few features by selecting a 500, not a 550. 
but I didn't care because it just worked and it was easy. It, you know, it was easy to set up. Um, but I remember that when I went to select the printer, they only had like a couple of dozen and they were HPs and I think Epson. I think there may have been yeah. a few Epsons. Yeah. And I'm like, people still use these Epsons? <laughs> Epsons are still sold today, actually. <laughs> I don't know who owns Epson, but I, but you still see things with Epson labels on yeah. them. The ones that I remember were the old dot matrix printers and I was sitting there thinking, oh, God, people yes. still use these? Whatever. Uh, yeah. the, driver, the drivers were, um, or the protocol forum was more or less open because you could just go online and you could look up, you know, the Epson escape characters and everything. So that's probably why they were able to get them to work. Well, the 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 escape characters, of course, are standard. Uh, you know, each printer uh, driver adds a few bells and whistles, but right. the escape characters, I was using escape characters in the 70s. Those, those have been around for a if long, I, long time. So If I remember back to my Commodore uh, day, Epson had an Epson mode, which used not standard uh, escape characters, but you could do a whole lot more with, with the Epson in Epson mode. And they had a uh, common mode. Was it a common mode? I don't know. It was it was something else, but you could switch back and forth between the two. And and basically in the in the common mode you were only getting text. And in the Epson mode you could get graphics. Uh-huh. So that was and but Epson published they have published the, the escape characters, so you could just write a program to take it to Epson mode and mm -hmm. shoot up. So I always thought that was nice. Um, Okie Data did the same thing. I had a couple of uh, graphics o Okie Data printers for the uh, for the Commodore, and they had they had Okie Data mode and they had, I guess it was Common mode, where the escape mm -hmm. where it would basically just print. Uh, text so that's what i remember about printers back in the day and that's yeah. why i was quite surprised when i bought this canon printer that you can't see that's up above me at the thrift store for like five bucks and when i went online and i oh wow linux supports these things okay because i had yep. only bought um, I had only been buying HP printers because I knew they would work. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Brother also uh, publishes uh, drivers for Linux. Uh, they're pretty thorough about that. Um, as a matter of fact, you don't just download one driver. You download a bundle that goes for a certain class of printers. And of course, you talk about proliferation. I mean, if you look at all the models of all the printers that have ever been made, I mean, there there are literally thousands of them. <laughs> I remember the early, 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 it had to have been the first version of, of Ubuntu. And you had to go in and you had to go to the printer profiles and you had to do this. And it was very much like like setting up a printer with Windows. Yeah. And this one here, I turned it on. I had to install one piece of software because I had to get it on the network. Um, and that it found the MAC address and it got it onto the network. And as soon as it was on the network, Linux popped up and said, hey, there's a printer on the network. You want to set this thing up? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yes, I do. <laughs> And I didn't have to go through all the, uh, I, I didn't have to select drivers or anything else. It just sort of took it a couple of minutes, but it just sort of knew what to do. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the, all of that's gone these days. I mean, basically, you go with <clears throat> with the latest version or the latest. I never go with the intermediate versions. I always go with the LTS versions. Uh, and I find I basically the printers are a piece of cake. Yeah. And I can remember in like 2007, 2008, struggling with the things because I had a client that was in love with brother printers and they were having all kinds of problems. I never forget they had a a color laser printer. A set of cartridges for that thing cost more than the original printer. I mean, I forget what what the exact numbers were, but we'll say the original printer cost four or five hundred bucks. A set of a full set of cartridges was in the same ballpark. Yeah. And I thought, boy, you know, you really, really need to be desperate for color to go that route. And I don't know if they even still make uh, laser color printers or not. Uh, I certainly haven't seen one in a number of years. <clears throat> um, I, I actually have a, a color laser printer in storage, but it's broken. Um, so, um, By the way, that the, 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 um, the the ink stuff, uh, whatever you call it, the powder in there is terribly toxic. Yeah. You do not want to breathe that stuff. All right. <laughs> I, I believe I believe that. Um, wireless color laser. Yeah, HP still makes color laser printers. What do they cost? Uh, kind of depends on the model, but looks like they top out at six hundred bucks. What do they bottom out is my question. <laughs> uh, brother, brother color laser printer T50. Uh, so that's brother. Oh, Lord, there's there's one for almost a thousand dollars, but yeah, it does a little bit more. It's a copier too. It, it, yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it looks like they top out around around that six hundred dollar range. 250 is the cheapest one I see. It's a brother. I had, see, we had a, you remember the phasers? Um, Xerox? Oh, God, yeah. Pardon? Xerox? Phaser? A GR oh, God, that goes back a ways. Man, those were the best printers ever. I loved that thing. Um, Took those like little crayon packs and uh -huh. heat up and melt melt the wax to the paper and they were pretty fast um we had two or three of those and i remember struggling to get linux what what it linux Linux had the driver for them, but it didn't want to print. It was mixing colors weird. It, it was doing weird color mixing uh -huh. kind of things. And I remember sitting there struggling, trying to just get it to print red. Just oh, red. really That's all I wanted to do. It kept mixing the colors. But I, I prefer the, uh, the laser printers over the inkjets. Well, yeah. Um, and the HP laser printer, uh, the HP color laser printers, um, if you buy a re recharged toner, you can get those pretty reasonable. Um, I think they're 40 bucks a, a toner something like that but i don't print enough color so the the toner lasts pretty much forever for me 
Yeah. I, I do very, very little printing. I much prefer to operate on a screen. Uh, but my wife, um, I don't know, she has never uh, gotten comfortable with working exclusively on the screen. And she wants to, for instance, any kind of bill or anything like that, she wants to print out a piece of paper. And I keep thinking, you know, the problem with, with paper, the problem with me with paper is the minute I print something out on paper, the paper gets lost. I toss it in a pile someplace and I just totally lose it. Whereas as long as it's in, it's on the disc someplace, I can do a search and find it. And it's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> I, I, uh, I go through stages. Um, you know, when we had, when we had the computer shop, of course, everybody wanted a receipt. So having a printer yeah. was, mandatory i would guess yeah it was it was all and and we had the phasers so we could do menus and other stuff we, we weren't just doing whatever but um we had a couple of high speed like really really freaking fast printers um that we had gotten we picked up at an auction and we decided to keep them and use them and try to make money off of them instead of selling them uh-huh um, and and we did but um i go through stages like sometimes i will print out like a section of the program i'm working on just so i could sit there and oh yeah for the draw for, on it and then scribble yeah, what for i'm the, thinking for that it's pretty handy there's no question about it but i i don't i mean i I don't really like having a whole lot of paper around. It's it's yeah. it seems wasteful to me, dude. Well, my problem is I just lose paper. It's it's <laughs> it's it uh, it seems to disappear once I turn it to paper. I mean, the stuff I, I probably have a file cabinet full of paper that, for whatever reason, I've thought is important, and I haven't looked at in probably twenty years. Yeah, I know. I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling. So I, I mean, it just it seems seems wasteful. But yeah, some people some people still need it. And I've got you know I've got that uh, my ebook reader, which is a little a little bit better. So I could make a PDF and stick it on there and yeah, go yeah. Is that a Sony or what is it? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Now, do they use the uh, the ink? The, the what e are they ink. called? Yeah, e ink. Yeah, which I think was originally an Amazon thing, and and then they started licensing it out to other producers. I I don't know who actually came up with that technology. Amazon seems like a likely. Yeah, it's real. It's real. Well, you get very, very crisp fonts. I and mean, it's uh, real low power. Yeah. The only the refresh rate on it is horrible, though. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I think that's probably fundamental to the technology. I don't think that's probably something you can do anything about with either software or, or I think it's it is the um, and, and of course if you're reading a book you know I mean you, you're you basically need something that's comparable with flipping pages right because you're not doing high speed graphics <clears throat> or whatever you're just basically you know paging through a book so but i like ebooks i gotta tell you we our house in california we literally don't have any place to put another book i mean i mean all of my all the paperbacks are double stacked um 
you know, and some of them are vertically stacked and so forth and so on. If we ever have a really bad earthquake, the cleanup is going to be god awful. Um, but we just got to the point where I said, because a lot of times for my kids, the default Christmas and birthday present would be some kind of a book. Hey, Dad, what kind of book? What book do you want this time? And it got to the point where I said, you're going to get me a book. <laughs> Here's a list of what I'm looking for. But they got to be ebooks because if if it's paper and books, I, paper and ink, I don't have any place to store right. it. And I also like the convenience of being able to take it with me. I can even look at it from on my desktop. I can look at it from my you know, I mean, I've got multiple desktops I use depending on where I am, because if I'm at school, I use one or two. If I'm here, I use one or two. If I'm in California in my office there, I use one or two. And then I also can look at them on my phone and a tablet and a laptop and so right. forth and so on. So I find it just tremendously convenient to be able to uh pop around from from uh, hardware to hardware and uh this, look at the ebooks this, they're this a little one. less they're a little less convenient with with um heavily techno technical books where you got a lot of diagrams and so forth and so on but even there the idea of being able to expand the diagram mm -hmm. and and uh, zoom in and zoom out and so forth and so on. It's pretty handy. This this one here is, I don't remember. I think it was finally done in uh, 20, maybe 2011. Mm -hmm. This is the last year for this, but it uses a micro SD card. It's got internal memory. I've got 150 books and I'm not even close to. I'm, oh yeah. Huh. I'm not even close to coming anywhere near what the memory limit is on this, so I could carry around an, a, a whole library. Yeah. So, and, so what's the maximum micro SD that it will take? I uh, think the last. I think it was thirty-two gig. Okay. Um, yeah, you can get a lot of books into 32 gigs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've got a two gig card in there right now. I mean, a small two gig card. Yeah. Right. Let's I see. don't know if you can even buy a two gig card anymore. The smallest I've seen in recent years. We'll see how much space I'm actually using. Come on. That's a micro or a mini? It's a micro. Okay. Uh, oh, of course, of course, it doesn't open where I want it to open. I am using 500 megs of my two gigs. So I've got 1.5 gigs left, and I've got 150 books on this site. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't I don't need a 32 gig card. Nope. Um this one was one of the first ones that, that I saw that would do PDFs that would actually read the PDF and render them correctly. Um mm -hmm. but it is really slow about it. So the new ones, the new ones are much, much better at doing that. Do you know what the what the uh, CPU in it is? No, no, I probably could find out. I think it must be it must be an ARM CPU of some sort or another. I would assume. If that's two thousand and eleven. Yeah. I yeah, that that's. Was, I think that was the gear that I finally decided that I had bought this. Let's 
says a Cortex A8, 800 megahertz. Single core. Huh. 2011, that's probably about right. It says... It says it's got... Is that internal? It's got 512 megs of RAM. I guess it's got 2 gigs internal storage. So that's not on the SD, or that is on the SD? The SD is separate. It, built in storage of two gigs. I hmm. didn't know that. Oh, I knew it. I knew it had built in storage. I didn't know it was that, that big. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now, now I want to move all my files over and recover my two gig. My two gig. Let's see, it uh, supports EPUB, PDF, text, FB2, RTF, XLS, DOC, and SHIM. Does it support MOBI? M O B I? No, no. There was a program for Windows that would convert your Mobi files to um, EPUBs. Well, you know, AZW, the Amazon default, is essentially Mobi with uh, some tweaks to it. Um, if, you, if you do a hex dump on it, you'll see someplace there in the, in the first thousand, first K byte, uh there's moby embedded in there and mm -hmm. it's uh it's essentially they essentially grab moby and so will it will it support azw or none no this is apparently not hmm. well that's probably back in the days when they were still battling it out with amazon and so forth and so on before everybody got wise to the fact that if you open source it, you make more money. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. I remember, I remember um, EPUB was going to be a standard and may still be a standard because I still see them, publicly, you know, you go to some of these websites and you can buy the books in Amazon format or EPUBs. Uh huh. Um, but I remember, I remember the reason why I bought a Sony was because I didn't want to be tied to any one provider. Yeah, they've provided you flexibility then. A bit, a bit of flexibility. I had another ebook. I can't remember what it was, but it was tiny. It was it was no bigger than than my phone. Um, uh huh. It had e paper in it, and it had um, or e ink in it, and it had something else. But it was exclusively a Mobi formatted. Huh. That was all it would do was Mobi. It wouldn't read text files. It wouldn't read. And that was that was the the software, so you could take anything and shove it in there and it would convert it to Mobi format, but it would also do it backwards. So you, if you dropped Mobi into it, it would convert it out to something else. But it natively would only read Mobi then. But yeah, my other, I don't remember who made that thing. It was a weird, it was a weird, it was a weird little thing and it would only read Mobi files. That was all it would read. Well, one of the things that I find as I as I age, <laughs> be tactful, as I get older, uh, fine print is just forget it. So I find 
although I can read all of my ebooks on my phone, uh, I much prefer to have it on the big screen <laughs> so that I can um, see the thing in a reasonable font size. That's that's uh, one of the drawbacks. I can change the font size on this, but it also changes the format, which makes oh, really? sense. But when you change the formatting, weird things start happening. The page, the pages don't line up correctly, and so, uh, so it's usually better just to go with the default font size. Well, now is that a touch screen or not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can't just do the spread finger thing and no, it's a single point, single point touch. It's it's old, it's old. Okay. Uh, well, I can remember. This is talking about old guys talking about the old days. Back in the seven, in the eighties, we were building a uh, big piece of semiconductor equipment, developing it actually, and somebody decided. This thing's got to have a touch screen. And this is long before modern touch screens. This is, this basically was a, a CRT that had a row of, of uh, IR LEDs along the vertical axis and a row of sensors on the opposite side. And then the same thing on the horizontal axis. So, the, the screen wasn't doing anything, but basically when you stuck your finger on the, on the screen, it, it broke the light beams in both X and Y, and it could sense where you are. Right. Um, later on, they, we used one that was a stylus, and it would basically sync up with the raster scan on the, on the screen so that when you touch the screen with the stylus, it would, the timing on the raster scan, it basically just had a, had a silicon sensor, a little uh, photocell sensor that sensed when the pixel came by or when the raster came by. Right. So uh, that was somewhat more sophisticated. And then, of course, they they came out with the ones they have now, and it's um, that's all history at this point. I got to tell you, I thought when we were first put down together in the, I guess, eighty seven or eighty eight, some I thought, who in the hell wants a touch screen? I mean, what's the point? <laughs> okay, you're just too lazy to. To put your fingers on the keyboard? <laughs> no anymore. If it doesn't come with a touch screen, people don't know what to do with it. <laughs> my, my my oldest grandkid, you know the, the smart TVs that have icons on all the displays? Or oh, yeah. For, for YouTube and all that. He was over at the house. He was seven maybe six he he kept hitting the tv apple i can't get it to work so what are you doing use the remote no it's a touch screen i can't get the touch screen to work look look it's, it's not, not a touch, a touch screen, screen. <laughs> it's not a touch screen yeah <laughs> Well, he's grown up in a world where everything is touchscreen. Everything's so. touchscreen. So, I both of my computers natively have touchscreens in them, and I don't use them. I really don't. I mean, every yeah. now and then I will come and I'll, I'll hit something, but um, I really don't use the touchscreens. Uh, they make sense on the phone. They make sense for for you know, tablets and that kind of stuff. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. But for, but for, um, for my desktops, my workstations, you know, first of all, I keep my, whoa. Hey Barry, how you doing? 
Alrighty, hey guys. Sorry, making noise. <laughs> oh yeah. Did you stumble over something, or was that uh, you dropped the microphone, or what? Uh, I just put my headset on. But I was adjusting the armature or whatever for the mic. Oh, I didn't okay. realize it starts unmuted. So <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. No problem. We were concerned you'd uh, tripped and broken your neck or whatever. So at any rate, so what do I want a touch screen on my workstation for? I mean, first of all, I keep my my screen on my workstations far enough away. I really have to lean forward in order to even reach them. I mean, there's no point. Yeah. So uh, you know, I've got a uh, I've got a good friend who she owns a business and. For her business, she has touch screens, and it makes perfect sense for her because it's the cash register and everything else, and it's sitting down below the cabinet, and she can just type the numbers in, and it makes perfect sense. She also has a mouse and a keyboard hooked up just in case the touch screen decides to react. <laughs> As happened okay. to her. <laughs> so what you doing, Barry? What's up? Oh, not too much. I almost forgot about you guys. And then I was like, oh, oh. So now I started the timer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Does the timer start at two, uh, three, three or four? No. Uh, three. 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 three but we're already, we're already over what I, what I put in. I mean, <laughs> well, I think as long as just two of us, the clock's probably not running. The clock doesn't run. So Barry, Barry started the timer. Okay, yeah, well. you got 40 minutes or I got to get out. Uh, Reset got, the timer. You got 20 minutes because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So food, food over, over, uh, overcomes everything else. <laughs> yeah. Say so Barry, I, I was looking at that um, government site for uh surplus equipment oh yeah and it turns out it's it's national apparently i i because i looked at um uh, at uh, some stuff in california and apparently a lot of universities and schools and so forth and so on have gone that as a way of gone that way as a means of disposing of their um various surplus equipment so that's really very handy the only thing that yeah. i don't don't like about it is you got to buy a pallet load of stuff in order to uh you know when i used to buy stuff over at the uc surplus place uh, i could go in there and buy a single tower or buy a single laptop or whatever um there aren't I, when I was looking at searching the other day, I didn't see any singletons. I saw mostly, um, you know, where you buy a, the smallest group would be a half a dozen or a dozen uh, towers or a half a dozen, a dozen laptops or whatever. So, is it, uh, it gov deals? Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, that's yeah. so. I said it's all over the board. It depends on the school and whatnot. Though, like I say, Ohio State sells a lot of stuff as single units. UC does it every once in a while, but I'm saying it's just a matter of time. You know, watch it for like two months. You'll find some singles probably. Okay. Well, if you ever define, decide to do a um, buy a pallet of stuff, let me know and I'll. Uh, I'll uh, take a few of them off your hands for uh, a reasonable markup, but uh, they had some what nice. Looking for? Mostly towers, mostly towers. I use laptops, laptops only under duress. <laughs> I don't like I don't like lugging them around with me and so forth and so on. And I don't I never have liked their keyboards, uh, but. Uh, Mostly um, some uh, Dell towers, 
but uh, in any case, two, yep. three, maybe four to the outside. Go Little go ones, big ones. Back. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barry. What'd you say? I was just wondering if you were looking for little ones or big ones or Xeon or i7 or have any uh, preference? Well, probably Xeons. Xeons. I don't know how you pronounce that, but uh, probably not i7s. As a matter of fact, if you can find some AMD stuff, I like those. Uh, I don't particularly care. Uh, given a choice, I much prefer AMD to uh, Intel, and that's just a personal bias. So, you know, I can't support that with any facts. Okay, <laughs> it's I don't just, know. I, I've had pretty good uh, over the years. I've had pretty good results uh, with um, AMD stuff, and frankly, I've had reasonable results with Intel as well. But you know. For example, I have um, uh, a tower that I use as my primary workstation here in Milford. And it's, um, it's an Intel box, it's probably uh, 2012, 2013, someplace along in there. And it works fine except that um, the, uh, the built-in NIC card on it got really flaky. It would work, it wouldn't work, it would work, it wouldn't work. I'd reboot and work for a while and then it really got flaky. I mean, and I move a lot of big files around. So definitely I exercise it pretty good. So I went on Amazon and said, all right, let me uh, let me see what I can get for a, what I can get a PCIe um, gigabyte uh, or gigabit rather uh, NIC for, and I don't know. I paid twelve bucks something like that for a for a one gig, and put that in there, and it works like a charm. So I don't know what went wrong with the one that's on the motherboard, but it just got so independable. Which brings me to a question I have for both of you. Have either of you ever used a one of these 2.5 gigabit or five gigabit NICs? I'm going to say no. <laughs> Well, they, they, they're, they're readily available now. Uh, at least you can buy them on Amazon. Some of them are, are a little pricey. One of them I saw was a, a giga, gigabit, uh, 2.5 gigabit and 5 gigabit. It was uh, 129 bucks, I think. But there are also some that are down there in the, in the 15 to 20 plus buck. Um, and I just wondered if anybody had any experience with those. It's kind of it's kind of academic because I think the router I've got is um, I think is is one gigabit and so yeah. it that may be my, that would have been my answer I would it. say Two and a half to five would have to be really old because the standard for a long time has been 10 um, well, from a corporate standpoint. And those are not that expensive anymore either because everybody's moved on to like 20 and 50 gig. So um, you can pick up 10 gig stuff fairly reasonable too. Sometimes. Well, you you're talking about... But I'm talking about a local area network for my home. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, I, I just I'm saying I, I've I've never even heard of the speeds of being you know two and a half or five. So I mean that stuff's probably got to be ancient. Um, but well, like, the, pre the the Knicks are are um, using current chipsets, so 
I don't know why they're two and a half or five, but uh, they're using current chipsets. So um, uh, I, I would think that they would be like fiber channel boards or something that probably went to an old SAN interface or something. But from a networking standpoint, like I said, I, I've never come across those speeds for network, well, but it's not is, saying that it wasn't, you know, the, something they were using 20 years ago. This is this is Ethernet, so um, so, and that's what I've got wired in my house is Ethernet. So uh, I uh, don't feel uh, inclined to go out and put uh, fiber throughout the walls in my house. Uh, cost me enough to get the um, Cat 5e pulled, so. And I'm at the point in my life where I don't crawl around in attics and so forth and so on. So even if I were inclined to, my wife would probably uh, lock me to the bedpost if I was pulled out a ladder and climbed up into the attic. <laughs> uh, so talking about gov deals, back yeah. in the day, that was where we got probably 90% of our surplus for resale. Oh, we'd buy, really? We'd buy the pallets. Um, you kind of got to watch because um, they, they started removing hard drives, which is pretty normal. Uh, but they started taking memory out, too, for some reason. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. They can somebody you see stealing all the RAM. Yeah, that, that's what I think happened was somebody who was told to uh, palletize them was taking parts. But um, oh yeah, yeah. We, yeah I have we, talked to some of the guys that you see about it, and they like, yeah, we don't care. Yeah, we always had really, really good luck with buying stuff from uh, Montgomery County, from Dayton. Always really? had good luck with with their stuff. Um, buy, you know, a couple hundred machines, and maybe five of them might actually be to the point where they couldn't be used, like bad, bad, bad. So you would end up with, you know, 190 machines that were good and sellable, and really five of them that would just end up going in the trash because that's where they needed to go. Now, were those stripped of hard drives? Uh, usually, they did not have hard drives, but they almost always had memory. Uh-huh. And um, they're, they're, the guy, at least at the time, he didn't really know the technology stuff at all. And uh, he, you know, he'd let you go in and look at the stuff and open the stuff up and, and look. But um, he, he was just listing it as what somebody would tell him it was. And sometimes it would be better and sometimes it would be a little worse. Uh -huh. But he always, it, it was never, um, unless they told him it was all for parts, which he would list parts machines there too you had a, a really good chance of getting really good machines really cheap because he didn't know what he what he had okay <laughs> sounds like he was a keeper <laughs> oh it, like i said we we shopped at uh montgomery county quite a bit but um the the sinclair uh community college and somebody Somebody else, they all pulled together there in Dayton and let this guy sell them. Uh, he, he worked for, for the city, but that was his job. That was all he, he did was sell stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, really, we, you could get good stuff from him. We bought uh, 60 laptops off of a pallet. I think we only paid like 200 bucks. And I think we only threw, let's see, there were 60 laptops. I think we threw five of those laptops 
we, we resold them as parts because they just weren't working right. Hmm. But everything else was good and 200 bucks for a pallet of laptops. So yeah, the that's a good supplies. deal. <laughs> yep, that's a good deal. It's a good deal. So, so the, the one thing I wonder is, so they strip all the drives out of these things. Those drives have got to go someplace. Where do they go? <laughs> they usually crunch them through a machine that smashes them. Oh, oh! So they they are destroyed. They don't just erase them and yeah, they're, they're they're field destroyed. It depends I, on. It's such a waste. Yeah, it depends on uh, on the department too. Yeah. Um. We uh, let's see. I think it was out of uh, Columbus. We literally bought a pallet of like a hundred machines, and two days later they listed a hundred a uh, hundred hard drives. Oh, really? So we turned around and <laughs> bought a hundred hard drives from them, knowing full well that they had to have come out of the hundred machines that we. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> one of the schools down in Kentucky sells the machines without hard drives and without the RAM, but then you can buy the RAM in a box, you know. Uh -huh. I, I almost screwed somebody over real bad because I was like, I want that box of RAM. <laughs> yeah. But I I forgot about it, and when I turned around, the auction was over, and I was like, crap, because I was going to buy that box. I, it would, uh, they were like eight gig sticks or something uh, DDR3 is like I rigged all my out to you know like 32 gigs of RAM machines or something and got some serious money for them because yeah. huh. the RAM was up to like a hundred bucks a chip then yeah well that was that was what three or four years ago when uh, after after uh, Thailand had its uh rain disaster wiped out a lot of um, of the factories over there. That uh, ram was really high not too long ago, like back around Christmas. Well, you know what the what the current problem is? Apparently they can build flash memory. Oh, the they're same manufacturing in the, SSDs. And, yeah. and they can build flash for uh, on the same fabs in the same fabs that they can build the ram so guess what happens well if you look at the the revenue per chip or whatever for flash versus the uh, revenue per chip for static ram uh it's a no-brainer. They're going to build uh, flash, and uh, so RAM has just uh, suffered from being the orphan <laughs> product, so to speak. So, at any rate, I mean, I think of in terms of how many gigs of flash memory have I bought versus how many gigs of RAM have I bought over the last five years. It's got to be 100 to 1. I mean, I I just, you know, I, I buy the RAM for a, for a desktop and I don't buy anything else, if, any more RAM for five years. Whereas I buy, you know, probably a, Hundred giga, gig, gigabytes or more of of flash memory per someplace between a week and a month. <laughs> okay, I mean, basically, I treat one as a as a throwaway commodity and the other as a, kind of a permanent hardware, so to speak. Yeah, I was looking up this two and a half gig. NIC cards are 30 bucks and it's like 90 bucks for a five port switch. That's not bad. Yeah. That's, I didn't realize that they'd come out with those. Yeah. There's some question on how well Ethernet 6 works with it, but. 
Well, what cabling do you need for that? Well, that's what some of this is saying. There's a lot of people asking if the, the Cat 6 works or if you need better. I didn't really read anything on it. It doesn't say, but the uh, I mean, I know there's a Cat 7 something protocol now. Oh, there is. Wire. There's also there's also a 6E, but um, I'll tell you, if you want a real challenge, you go and and uh, and uh, put put cable ends on those. They're a pain, as far as I'm concerned. Cat, <laughs> even Cat Six is a pain because they've got that little spine that goes down the middle of them, and you got to get it cut just right and so forth. So Five E is a piece of cake by comparison. Well, that's the thing. I think it's kind of funny though. It's like they're, you can buy like old uh, 10 gig NICs for looks like another $10 more. So it's like, you'd, of course, the switches might cost you a little bit more. Yeah. Well, like 200 bucks or something. In, in for, retrospect, for in retrospect, if I were building a house today, I would probably put fiber throughout, <laughs> okay, with um, with conduit with extra pull lines in it, okay. But uh, you know, there was a time when you know when I was at Kaiser in around 2000, 2001, in Northern California, we had ten base T throughout the entire corporation. And it was a real pain, even in 2000, uh, because it just, you know, you couldn't, if you tried to transfer a big file, you basically set it up at night, went home, came back the following day, Been looked there, at your progress. <laughs> I know, <well>, yeah. <laughs> and so it was. And hope it doesn't fail somewhere. The network, oh, network here you go. Oh yeah, they get a glitch someplace along the line and just start over again. Whereas, you know, I would love to have fiber here, um, but we can't even get fiber at the at the curb um, for some reason or another. When uh, Cincy Bell started putting in fiber, uh, they. Um, I don't. I don't know. We just. They just skipped us. And this they only a, do like high population areas. Well, we're a fairly high population area. It's a moderately upscale housing area. My son-in-law and daughter, who live um, about six or seven miles from us, have fiber at the curb, and and they're uh, probably average housing price in that area is maybe half what it is here. So uh, it's not like um, there's not a market here, but the best you can do in our area is go with spectrum cable. And that gives me uh, 400 maximum of 400 down and 20 up. Whereas the fiber is capable of a lot more than that. Well, I got, yeah, I've, I've got two things to say. Chapter seven is the first thing, but that's all right. Um, okay. The uh, back, back to gov deals, just, just because I just now saw one, there's a guy in Vandalia who has listed phone equipment on here. But when you go and look, it's a whole stack of servers. Really? So don't trust what they're listing either. Okay. So I, they they don't know. It they the it, it's some um procurement officer or somebody who is told, you know, the department says, Oh yeah, we pulled that out of the phone room or yeah, pulled this out of whatever. And that's what they're going to list it at because they don't have any idea what, what some of this stuff is. 
So basically, he's just a quartermaster, is what you're saying. Yes. He's a, he uh, or a yeoman or, or something like that. Yes. He he got two points higher on his IQ test, and they selected him for <laughs> for quartermaster. Oh, oh, you 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 understand computers? Go and sell stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you can uh, take pictures. Go and sell the, stuff. <laughs> these. The office, the, when I bought all this stuff off the office of the waterworks for Dayton, I mean, the guy was a pipe, a pipe fitter. He didn't know here at all. So, wow. So, so they, they changed because just, the guys they brought them here, dropped them on this table, and we post them. Yeah. The oh, guy wow. from Dayton that we were dealing with, he was the full time guy, and that's all he, all he did was he sat in a room and took you know, sheets of paper that people told him what the stuff was and he would list it on Gov deals and sell it. <laughs> and then he would okay. go out and it, they have a, a pickup day or a pickup time and he would go and meet you at, at the pickup site. And So they weren't even taking delivery on it. They were just basically... Uh, it, it would go to a warehouse. There's yeah. A, in, in Dayton, in the Dayton area, there were like six warehouses, and sometimes you would end up going to two or three of the warehouses to pick your stuff really? up. Really? You'd just say, follow me, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> so. Fun times, fun times. But that's, all I'm saying, though, is don't, don't just look in the um, communications or the computer thing. Yeah. Look, Look in some of the other categories because some yeah, well, of these places don't know what they what they are what they've well, got. Well, it, it was interesting to me that the the spectrum of stuff that they sell. I mean, it's not just computers or telephone equipment. It's not even all electronic. I mean, they there they, was a it, there was a they, yeah there was load of pipe that uh, they had for sale in one site. They. Uh, they had a plane for sale the other day. It was a like a Cessna 172, with for thirteen thousand. That was probably the Highway Patrol, wasn't it? No, it was actually a hangar that was, or one of the okay. like small hangars up toward Dayton. Somebody brought it in and stored it in the hangar in like 2012, and then never came back. And they were tired of it taking up their hangar space. Interesting. Gov deals is open to any any municipal body. So, if you're a if you're a government agency, doesn't matter how big or small you are, you can sell on Gov deals. Now they must take some sort of percentage off the top. They I'm do. assuming. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah, it, it, there's a some of the sales on. Like I said, have like a ten percent. Um, auction fee on the end or a sales tax of some kind or sometimes both depends on the organization how they have it and what the deals are most most of the time you're going to pay a buyer's premium at at very very least you're going to pay, pay a buyer's premium which basically covers the cost of what gov deals makes uh-huh so you're you're paying you're paying their fee basically well, that's okay. I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with paying brokerage fees. I mean, uh, um, but I have found like, I have found computers listed in what is that kitchen equipment? Oh um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, like a cafeteria might have computers for a point of sale or, or something. Yeah. And so, the department it came from was the cafeteria, so it must be kitchen equipment, right? <laughs> right. I've seen TVs listed as kitchen equipment because, you know, schools have televisions in some of their cafeterias, and that's interesting. So, 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 just, uh, just, just know that you're saying browse. Browse and see what really is there. What I used to do is, or what I had had done in the past was go to the, like the location search, and you put your zip code in and select like maybe fifty miles or a hundred miles, 
and then you yeah. just click on it, all every one of them that that's there. And if they're selling a car or something, you know you don't want that, so you click on click right back yeah. out of it. But that's how I usually find some of this stuff, or that's how I find a lot of it. <laughs> now it's not open to private individuals, so it's all only government agencies of some sort or another. Um, Gov deals only lets government sell, but you can buy as a private person. You can come along and buy okay. whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. And then there's actually go go ahead. A, I was gonna say there's a subsite on there too that goes to a more open. Um, they you can't get commercial ads for the other. Yeah, like like a yeah. uh, state liquidation sales or something. Yeah. Oh, really? Interesting. There's um sometimes like if you look in the police equipment um part, you'll see that there there might be a restriction that it, whatever they're selling has to be sold to another department police department or that, somebody with the uh, has more FLC. to do with the laws of that particular state than it has to do with you buying it or not i see so i want uh, we were buying um some scuba equipment and it was restricted um like from kentucky we couldn't buy it but Ohio had the exact same equipment for sale at the time, and we were allowed to buy it. So, interesting. Go and figure that one out. It just has something to do with how the quirky laws work. They, they, uh, Kentucky would only sell it to other fire departments. They were expecting like volunteers to buy it or something. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know, but you'll see that every now and then. But I, I've never seen that for computers. Have you ever seen that for computers, Barry? No, the only thing I've really ever noticed is on a couple of the vehicles. Um, yeah. There's a company that sells Humvees sometimes, and sometimes they're open, sometimes they're not. Um, and then all the firearms require you to have a guns broker license, basically. They won't yeah. sell the guns to a purse, a private citizen. Yeah. That, that so they true. want you to go through registration. That yeah. sort of makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. But well, it's kind of annoying because my uncle just let his license lapse last year. So <laughs> no buying guns. It um it, it, Gov Deals is a great resource though. You can buy a lot of stuff. Usually a lot cheaper than anywhere else. Yeah, I've seen some serious junk that's not worth what they want for it though. Well, well, that's because but, there's a depreciation scale that that some of these places have to go by. Even if, even if it's not worth that, they go well. It only we only had it for two years, so it's only depreciated by twenty percent. Well, that's like so somebody was selling a like fourteen year old macbook air the other day and they had a reserve set for like 700 dollars. so i'm like are you oh, really? serious <laughs> that's insane that's somebody who doesn't know what they've got i was gonna say like add 200 more and you can go to micro center and buy one that's a year old refire <laughs> yeah yeah i i actually i don't shop on gov deals anymore but not because not because the the stuff isn't good it's just because i don't sell this stuff anymore i don't i don't deal with this anymore yeah well it's hard to move the stuff anymore a lot of people i don't know why people you know everybody wants the newest latest fanciest but they want to spend like a hundred bucks and it's like well it's like i can get you a hell of a nice system for a hundred bucks but it's gonna be you know five or six years old you yeah. know and it's still going to be good for about anything you're going to use it for well that's that's just it it's 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 we we were finding that people were going for the cost you want for that i could just go to micro center and and get it you know but yeah that that'll and, be a, a three-year-old junk thing that was a pile of crap <laughs> in comparison well that was our that was always our argument but that works sometimes and sometimes it didn't. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, as I said, there's a huge difference between a brand new i3 that's, you know, two years old sitting in Micro Center versus, you know, a four year old i7 at, you know, twice the clock speed. Oh, Sometimes you just can't convince people of that. Anyway, we're down to four <laughs> minutes anyway, because the thing popped up and said four minutes now. But okay, I'm getting hungry. I got to go get food before rest okay. of decide not yeah. to okay. not give me food. Get your dinner, sir. <laughs> yeah, well, if you hear, any, if you hear anything about, uh, about Jim, it. let us know. Uh, at this point, uh, we're completely in the dark, to say the least. We are uh, we are more in the dark today than we were before, I think. But Well, I thought he would be back by now, but uh, apparently it was more serious than they anticipated. Yeah. I hope he's okay. I will I will let everybody know that, that he's still being thought of. So, yep. I will talk to everybody later and probably see everybody next week. Okay, very right. good. Take care. Bye, Barry. Bye, Leroy. Bye.